we've basically reached the end of the line for Total War Warhammer 2, the second game of a planned Total War fantasy trilogy. Any content added at this point should be a pre-order race that will be available in the next game as well. So what is the state of the game, here and now, before we head into the final chapter? This isn't a review per se, but it will share some aspects. I'm talking about how this game feels right now for single player and what we'd like to keep or change as we continue our Total War Warhammer journey. I'm going to cover the good, the bad, and the ugly, and then I'll have some stats for nerds. First up, the good. This game is so much fun. It's hard to quantify, but this game has exactly the elements you want out of a video game. You can be the beast that steamrolls your opponents, or you can tread a thin line between victory and defeat. Even on the best of campaigns, you might be worried about losing it all, and that's why it's so engaging every time you play the game. It's also absolutely beautiful. There are stunning unit models, incredible battle backdrops, and some very interesting battle animations. In terms of actual gameplay, field battles are complex, potentially nail-biting experiences, but exactly what people play this game for. There are also a lot of different maps that add variety to each battle as the game progresses. We also have heroes and lords that feel exactly as their name implies. You can make these people super strong omens of doom, if that's how you want to play. If not, just don't use them. But it's nice to have single characters like this that are easy to name when you get to know them, cherish them when they win a clutch battle for you, and then mourn them when they're lost. These characters give so much life to the game. There's also incredible variety that gives the game such good replayability that people like me can play something new every single day. Each faction, particularly DLC factions, have unique mechanics that can make one campaign feel very different every time you play it. There's such a variety of unit types, you'll struggle to fit them all in a single army. We have melee infantry, missile infantry, hybrid units, cavalry, ranged cavalry, shock cavalry, war beasts, single entity monsters, monstrous infantry, monstrous cavalry, spellcasters, flying units, artillery, monster artillery, war machines, chariots, ranged chariots, and support units. Did I forget something? That was a lot. Now that that's said though, let's start to dive into the bad. Sieges. Let's talk about how awkward it is to have a doom stack of phoenixes that you're sieging a city with and they can't figure out how to fly over the walls so you build a battering ram? When flying units can simply bypass the walls and zombies apparently carry ladders in their back pockets, why do I need to hire these ogre mercenaries for the siege attacker trade? It just doesn't make any sense. The pathfinding and general line of sight in sieges is incredibly buggy. We have the dancing artillery bug, the conga line to enter the city, and so many other issues that make sieges, which end up becoming a great chunk of the manually fought battles, so darn tedious. Now I'd hardly like to complain without offering up some solutions of my own or some I've heard in the community. CA has said they're working on sieges, but these are some of the things that I and others in the community would like to see before game three. I think one thing that would make sieges more interesting, although not necessarily less tedious, is implementing some of the in-battle build options that CA showed off for the survival battles of Game 3. If these in-battle build options are added to sieges, that would potentially mean encountering new and varied obstacles to victory when you do have to fight sieges. But I do think Auto Resolve should be better able to account for how the walls affect the balance of power. Part of the tedium of sieges is you have a basically indestructible army, but Siege Auto Resolve says, nah man, everybody's dead. So you have to fight yet another battle with few casualties that takes a while, simply because the Auto Resolve hasn't figured out how you attack, so you keep fighting it over and over and over. There's plenty more that can be done with sieges, but I think everybody's on board with some sort of general improvement, even if it's not necessarily one of the ones listed here. Hopefully we do see meaningful siege updates in the next game. Moving on, we have a rudimentary and clunky diplomacy system. It's difficult to know how unlikely any agreement is, and we already have a model for that in Total War Three Kingdoms, where you can find out exactly how much money it would take to finally make that deal work. Please bring that to this game, CA. There's a reliability system which is very punishing to the player, but means nothing to AI factions which is also noticeable in how AI factions will invite other factions they hate to join in war against you. When the proud Kieslevites invite the Greenskins into war with Chaos, you wonder if there actually is diplomacy in this game or if it's just a pretend screen. There are built-in negative relation modifiers in many factions, but the AI seems to completely disregard those, which only hurts the player. I'd like to see the AI have some of these penalties too. I don't want to see another campaign where the dwarves and the Skaven are best friends just because they're both beating up on Grimgore. What happened to all those grudges? 
I also feel that Confederation's in a painful state right now. If you're playing one faction and you want to confederate another, you need just tons of money and positive relations, and you usually have to be stronger than them. But that's a catch-22, because the stronger you are, the more great power penalty you get, causing lower relations. I'd like to see more factions that have built-in confederation options. The Greenskins and Norskins can beat other leaders into submission. Bretonians can research their way to confederation. The Empire has events that offer confederation. And Beastmen can now just buy it with bread. These are very nice options that play into the game mechanics that don't make you have to adjust your playstyle by holding less territory to negate great power or saving up sometimes literally millions just to acquire a good lord. There are a lot of little things that could probably use some updates, but I think I hit the big ones that kind of bother you in every campaign you play. Derpy sieges, unfriendly AI factions, and greedy allies who want to take all your money so you can offer them protection. So now let's move on to the ugly. This guy. Am I right? Just kidding, just kidding. I'm sorry. But seriously, there are some real lighting issues in this game. I think I was actually temporarily blinded by one of Alithanar's special underway battles. My eyes hurt just thinking about that battle, and adjusting the lighting settings couldn't counteract the effects. I had to go back a few turns and change my movements so I didn't encounter that particular battle. I really hope they do a lighting balance overhaul in a patch before game three, because sometimes it's truly painful. On the other hand, a lot of other battle maps are absurdly dark, to the point where you're squinting around trying to find your units and the enemy's units and, oh wait, I was clicking nothing. We've seen complaints about unit cards being ugly. I personally never got that one, but CA has been making steady improvements to these even in game patches. Like I said though, this game is absolutely gorgeous. It just means that when you do run into these issues, it's all the more jarring. So I do hope that CA patches out some of these issues before they stop working on Warhammer 2. All right, we've made it through the Clint Eastwood part of the video. Let's move on to the stats for nerds. So I've gathered the data over time from steamcharts.com that shows the peaks and valleys of people playing the game. As expected, we see some big jumps in play when DLC comes out. A fairly small increase in players came for the release of the Tomb Kings, despite how many people insist to me that it's the best DLC. And also, we got Tretch. A giant increase came with the release of the Queen and the Crone, a big update to the base game factions, and a free lord. Also, a new mechanic, the Sword of Cain, that brought some interesting options to the game for all factions, in addition to a minor door free work. October 2018 seems to have gotten an increase in players simply due to the free updates about to be released. Updates like the Vampire Count rework and Lokir release that came in November. Now, I don't want to go over literally every spike here, but it should give us an idea of what decisions CA will make based on what has gotten the most people playing in the past. The biggest spike was with the Warden and the Ponch DLC, which did a major and meaningful rework of a Game 1 faction, along with compact Vortex campaigns that didn't participate in the Vortex. We've seen campaign victory conditions in both Vortex and Mortal Empires campaigns becoming more straightforward to achieve, and we've seen these meaningful changes to existing factions. We as players have spoken, and all we want is new ways to play the game. As we wrap up Game 2 and head into Game 3, I think most of us are pretty pleased with where Warhammer 2 is right now. The pleasure far outweighs the pain. Will this joy and excitement carry on to Game 3? We don't have that much information yet, but I think if CA hasn't made enough meaningful changes to the starting factions of Game 3, most of us will return to Game 2 to play with the factions we've come to know and love. Do you agree that this game's in a good spot to carry on the legacy if Warhammer 3 falls a bit flat at launch? Let me know in the comments below what you think, and thanks for stopping by!